If you will turn in your Bibles to Joshua 24, we're going to be in Joshua 24 and Judges 1. Um, last week, we introduced the book of Judges to you, and um, as, as seeing the crowd is much smaller than it was last week, I, th- I think the introduction did what it was supposed to do. <laughs> it scared everybody to death. Um, <laughs> so, no, I'm kidding. So, uh, tonight, what we're going to do as we get into Judges 1, before we do that, we really kind of need to set the context, and that's why we're going to be in Judges 24. Now, we're not going to read all of the book of Judges tonight, or I'm um, sorry, all the book of uh, Joshua 24. We're going to read a selection of that, and, um, but I want us to, to kind of understand. So Joshua 24 is really Joshua's last words uh, to the people of Israel before uh, he dies. And, you know, God gives him, you know, this understanding that he's about to die, and so he wants to make sure that he helps these people understand what's coming next, what God expects of them, um, how they need to live and approach, you know, their life. Um, and, and we're going to kind of work through that tonight. And it's interesting, the way he starts out is in Joshua 24, 1 through 13, he does a, a brief history lesson. Let me catch this up here. And, and basically, if you kind of had a phrase that would kind of, you know, frame this, this chapter, it's, we will serve the Lord. Um, the, the people of Israel say this over and over and over again, uh, as Joshua was talking that we will serve the Lord, we will serve the Lord, we will serve the Lord. Um, and it's funny, it, it seems like 30 seconds after Joshua died, that went out the window, right? Um, but, but, but Joshua gives them a brief history lesson. And I would encourage you uh, tonight or when you have some time to go back and read Joshua um, 24 verses 1 through 13. Because uh, it's interesting. What, what Joshua does is he goes all the way back to Abraham. And he says, from ancient times, God has been calling you. God has been leading you. God has been guiding you. He, he found your father Abraham and his father uh, Terah and uh, found them in a, in a foreign land and brought them out of that land. Or, I'm sorry, his father Nahor uh, out of the land of Terah. Um, they, they, they bring them out and, you know, he called them to follow them. And then he talks about how he delivers them out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land and, and conquered mighty enemies for them uh, that, you know, that he was putting enemies to flight. He did all these kind of things. And then he, with verse 13 says, so I want you to look at this. He says, I gave you a land on which you'd not labored and cities which you had not built and you've lived in them. You were eating of vineyards and olive groves, which you did not plant. Now, this echoes Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy says the same thing. Um, in fact, what, what Moses says is that when they get into the promised land, that God's going to give them houses they didn't build, vineyards they didn't plant, all these kind of things. And when that happens, to not forget the Lord. That you're going to come into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and, and the, the, the temptation is going to be to forget him, to forget that it was God who brought them here and God who did this for them. Now, Joshua, building on that lesson, I want you to read with me. We're going to go in verse 14. He builds on that and really wants to challenge these people. And I want you to listen as he's, you know, sharing this wisdom. And and really, it should be powerful because these literally are his last words. Um, He gets to the end of the chapter and he says, look, I'm going, I'm going the way of all flesh. You know, my time has come. And it's, it basically is like Joshua got done and he died. I mean, it was just pretty quick. Um, so these are very important words, and I want you to, to listen as we go through this. And, and as always, if you have questions or discussions, stop me. We're not in any hurry. Uh, we want to make sure everybody's on the same page and understanding. So he says, Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served uh, beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The people answered and said, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us, out of the, uh, brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and who did these great signs in our sight and was preserved all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through the midst we passed. The Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites who lived in this land. We also will serve the Lord for he is our God. Then Joshua said to the people, you will not be able to serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgression or your sins. 
If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do, har- do you harm and consume you after he has done good to you. People said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen for yourselves the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now, therefore, put away the foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey his voice. So I want to stop there and, and we'll kind of pick up in a minute when they make a covenant. But so you hear very clearly Joshua's testimony, these last words to the people. And he starts with now, therefore, and I always love that word, therefore, because we need to ask, why is it therefore, right? Right. And why it's there for is he's building on everything that he said. He's given them this history lesson of what God has done and how God's been faithful and kind and all those kind of things and compassionate and deliverer. And he says, now, because all of these things are true, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And and I love that. He calls them to fear the Lord. And you would think that these people had seen amazing and wonderful miracles. They had seen God deliver them out of Egypt with the plagues. They had seen God destroy the Egyptian army at the Red Sea. They had seen God rain manna on them for 40 years, you know, uh, in the desert and provide water and all those kind of things. And then they had seen God bring them into the promised land and deliver them from their enemies. You, You would think that the first thing that he would say wouldn't be fear the Lord. But that's what he says, fear the Lord. And the reason he says that, he says, fear the Lord, um, but it's fear the Lord to serve him in sincerity and in truth. And and another word would would be that way, would be your heart and your mind. Sincerity would be heart action. Truth would be a mind kind of thing. That it's these two things that are not in opposition, that they go together. Unfortunately, for many of us, what happens is we're kind of all one or the other. We're either all heart or all head, right? Right? And sometimes it doesn't feel like those ever connect. And so what God's telling his people is, it's not enough to feel it and have heart. You have to know it. It's not enough to know it if you don't have any heart. It's very reminiscent of what Jesus says in John chapter four, verse 23. You know, he's talking to um, the woman at the well and, um, and you know, she's talking about where we worship and how we worship. And he says, listen, there's a time coming and now is where God desires people to worship him in spirit and in truth. He didn't say spirit or truth. He said spirit and truth. The the combination of heart and mind, of sincerity and truth. And and here's the thing. You must have both of these things for real worship. And what we're going to find out is that the Israelites and, you know, by extension us, struggle with that. Because there are times when we're all heart. We just have all the feels, right? And that's what we want. We want to show up and we want to feel something. Forget the truth. I don't care about the truth. I want to feel something. And that's where a lot of people are, you know? Um, I've had pe- people tell me sometimes, well, you know, I know you were preaching out of the Bible tonight, but I just, I just didn't feel it. Like, what does that even mean, you know? I just didn't feel it. And then you have people on the opposite end that they love the truth, but it never moves their feelings, I mean, they know every right word, they know every right doctrine, but they have no feeling of connection to God or responsibility to share the truth or any feeling about anybody else. And God says that neither one of those places is good. And so what we're going to see is people who are driven by their feelings or driven by what they believe to be truth, and they never really bring those two things together. Now, it's interesting. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah, and that, that is important what you're saying about the sincerity. You know, people, people will say, well, if, if you're sincere, that's what's most important. Well, here's the problem. You can be sincerely wrong. <laughs> so your sincerity needs to be backed by truth, right? Um, and so you're exactly right. It, it, it is that thing of, you know, when sincerity becomes too much and it's not grounded in truth. Now, here's an interesting thing. He's going to tell them, to put away the gods that your father served. Listen to what he says in verse 14. Therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Does it surprise you 
that these people are still actively serving the gods of Egypt. It shouldn't surprise you because in Amos, Amos tells the people of Israel, and we're talking about thousands of years after they've come out of, um, out of Egypt. We're talking to, you know, several, like 2,000 years after they've come out of Egypt. Amos is telling them that they're still worshiping the same gods that they worshiped in Egypt. But it's shocking. You know, God brings them out. They go through the Red Sea. They, they have the fire by night and the, the cloud by day and the fire by night. They have the manna. They have all these things. And yet... And they would say, yes, we, and they're going to say in this chapter, we will serve God. We love God. We will serve God. But we still have all these other gods that we're serving. And one of the things that I think we need to recognize, and I think it's important when we see here, is the culture that you grow up in has a big influence on you, whether you understand it or not. The nation of Israel lived in Egypt for 430 years. 430 years of hearing about Ra and Isis and Osiris and Anubis and all these other gods and all these contrary stories to God their father and God being the creator and all these kind of things. And then Moses comes along and brings the story of God back to them. And, and so now they've kind of combined the two things together. Well, we'll take the stuff that we knew from our growing up, our culture, and we'll just mix it in with God and we can worship God that way and he'll be okay with it. And Joshua says, no, that's not going to work. You must worship with sincerity and truth. You have to let go of these things and hold on to God. And listen to how he explains it to him. Verse 15. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord. Now, he doesn't immediately say, oh, and I know that you guys are going to serve God. What does he say? He uses the negative. If it's disagreeable to you, because maybe there's some mumbling and murmuring and, you know, some people batting their eyes or turning their heads or, you know, whatever they're doing. And here's what he says. Look, hey, if it's disagreeable to you, that's okay. But you got to make a choice. You got to make a choice. You're either going to serve the Egyptian gods that you brought with you, or you're going to serve the Amorite gods where you're living right now. But you're going to serve something. And, and, and what Joshua is uncovering here is, is something that's very real. When people reject God, it's not that they don't worship anything. It's that they worship everything. And so what he's saying is, look, you need to understand that you're making a choice. Whether you fully understand that or not, you are making a choice. So if you choose to say, yeah, I, I like God and I like what he does for me. I like the blessings that he gives me. But I also want some of this other stuff over here where you're making a choice. You can't have both. So you have to choose. Now, as they always do, they say, and I love this, far be it from us that we should serve other gods. I mean, basically what they're saying is, Joshua, we don't know what you're talking about. We're not, we're not those kind of people. We don't worship the gods that our fathers worship. We don't want to be back in Egypt. We, we saw all this stuff. No, we, we don't want to do that. <laughs> and so... Look at what he says in verse 16. People answered and said, far be it from us that we should forsake the, the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us, uh, brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us all the way in which we went and among the peoples in which we, drove, who we passed through. The Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also, we also will serve the Lord for he is our God. Now, Joshua had just said that famous verse that we like to quote, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. <laughs> and then Joshua said, you're not going to be able to serve God. Because he's already told them to let go of the gods that they're serving. And they're saying, we don't serve anybody else but God. And I want you to look down uh, in verse 23, because he's going to say it again. Therefore, put away the foreign gods, which you are serving. How frustrating do you think it is to talk to people who cannot see and do not believe that they are guilty of the very thing that you're talking about? It's the wonderful game of self-deception that we play. It's very easy for us to come to God's word and hear something from God's word and say, well, that's not about me. But we know 15 people that it's about, don't we? You know, on Sundays and Wednesdays, we can hear these things and we can kind of look around the room and go, yeah, she needs it. He need, you definitely need it and, and miss the one who needs to hear it because we don't feel like that, that we're that way. And so here's what Joshua was saying. Listen, 
you know, I want you to serve the Lord. This is what I'm calling you to do. This is what the whole history of what God has done in our life has brought us to. I want you to serve the Lord. And they're like, we already are. And he's like, no. If you were serving the Lord, we wouldn't have went in the wilderness for 40 years. If you were serving the Lord, we would have already conquered all the land. And we're going to get to that in a minute, how they had not done that and will not do that. So no, there's these glaring, gaping holes in your life, in your sincerity, in your truth, and in your obedience that we need to deal with. And I'm about to die. And so you need to handle this for yourself. But far be it from us, far be it from us we, that we should serve other gods. And basically Joshua looks at him and goes, you're doing it right now. It, it almost feels to me like when you're dealing with one of your kids and you've told them to do something or not do something, and you're like, hey, what's going on? Well, I didn't do it. You have it in your hand right now. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> you know? Or I told you to, I did clean it up. It's sitting right here on the floor. No, it's not. No, we, we don't know what you're talking about. Well, you're doing it right now. And then he says something like, this is powerful stuff. He says, you're not going to be able to serve the Lord. And I, I think this is very prophetic that, of what Joshua was saying, because what he tells them in these few short verses really is just kind of the, if you could say the life verse or the motto for the people of Israel, this is what it is. So listen to what he tells them. He says in verse 19, you will not be able to serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done good to you. Now, you would hope that a stern warning from someone that they loved dearly, that knew that that loved them dearly, and that someone that spoke for God would kind of shake them, but it doesn't. But I want to unpack what he says here because this is important. He says, listen, you are not going to be able to serve God. Not that God isn't going to be able to take care of you or that God isn't going to provide for you, that God isn't going to protect you. You are not going to serve him. And so he says, one of the reasons that you're not going to be able to serve him is he is a holy and jealous God. And what Joshua is saying here is something that people and us really struggle with. When we hear holy and jealous, we think jealousy, we think Jealousy is bad, right? Human jealousy is bad. Human jealousy is about something I want or something I feel like I need that you have that I don't have, and so I'm mad about it. God's jealousy is you are choosing wrong. You are not choosing right, and he is jealous for you because he wants you to choose right and be blessed. And so here's the thing. When it says he is holy and jealous, it means he actually cares how we live. He does a very stark contrast to the gods that they carried with them because the gods that they carried with them did not care how they lived. The Egyptian gods, the Canaanite gods, the Amorite, Hittite, whatever gods that you want to put on, don't care about your morality. What they care about is do you provide them sacrifice? Are you there for their using and urging? And God says, no, you, you are here. You are created in my image. I, want, I care how you live. I care what you do. It is important that you do right and not do evil. And so what he's saying is, listen, you're not going to be able to serve this God because this God isn't like the God that you like. The gods that you like, like you, and don't care. Don't care how you live. And you say, well, Michael, that, that sounds a little harsh. Well, I, I get that. But if you haven't read the book of Judges, you would say that. <laughs> If you read the book of Judges, you recognize these people didn't care how they lived. In fact, we we find out that they did what was right in their own eyes, and they didn't care to know the Lord, and they didn't care to follow the Lord, and yet they wanted him to bless them. They wanted him to protect them. They just didn't want to follow him. So he says, listen, he's a holy and jealous God. You're not going to be able to follow him. Not only that, he will not forgive you. Now, that's a scary thing, and and this is where people don't understand the context, and they think that this is teaching something contrary to Jesus, and that Jesus is the lovey, cushy, you know, sweet part of God, and Yahweh, God the Father, is the really tough, mean guy, and so thankfully, we get to live with Jesus now in the Old Testament and not the scary God. Well, that's not true. 
What he's telling them is, again, your God, Yahweh, the Lord God, the one true living God is not like the gods that you carry around with you. The gods that you carry around with you don't care how you live and how you treat other people. And they let you slide on all sorts of horrible things. If you give them what they want through sacrifice and offering and prayer, basically manipulating them, if you manipulate them enough, they'll give you whatever you want. They don't care. And here's what he's saying. That's not who your God is. Your God is not going to let you slide and he's going to tell you what's right and what's wrong. And so it's not saying that he will not forgive because God says all throughout the Old Testament that he is a kind, compassionate, loving, forgiving God. I mean, how many times have we seen it? The people do something stupid, they get in trouble, and God comes and saves them. And in fact, we're going to see that all through the book of Judges, he does the same thing. So if he really mean, meant that God wouldn't forgive, then like this book would be a lot shorter. We would get to Judges chapter 1, and they would do all the mess that they're doing, and then God would wipe them out, and that would be over. <laughs> that would be pretty much the end. We would have no rest of the Old Testament at that point. But that's not what happens. But what he's saying is, listen, the God that you serve, the God that loves you, the God that's done all these things that requires your love and your, your you know, obedience, he, he's not going to let you slide. You know, it's this whole idea of I can do just enough good stuff to get God off my back and, you know, I don't have to change. I can do. No, there is no such thing. God cares deeply. And because he cares deeply, he's not going to let you slide. And then it says he will hold you accountable for your sins. He will not forgive your transgression or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve other gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you. So, what he's saying here is that God will hold you accountable and bring consequences to your life. And that's one of the things that we see in Judges. Uh, we see all throughout the Old Testament is that these people tested it. Ah, uh, you know, God doesn't really mean that. He, he doesn't really care. So let's just go do what we want to do. And so they do. And then God brings a foreign nation in to throw them into slavery and bring oppression into them. And then they freak out and turn back to God. How could you do this? Why are you doing this? Where have you gone? Well, I'm just holding you accountable like I told you I would. And so here's what Joshua is saying. Listen, you guys need to get your act together and really decide who you're going to follow because who you follow is very important. And if you choose to follow this God, you need to understand what you're getting into. And this is one of the things that I appreciate about the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. It doesn't pull any punches about what it means to follow God. And, and it doesn't get any easier when Jesus comes along. In fact, Jesus raises the stakes. He says some things like, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Oh, you've heard it said as, you know, as long as you don't sleep with somebody who's not your wife, you're okay. What I say is if you look with lust at someone of the opposite sex, you've committed adultery. That's pretty rough, you know? He's going to hold you accountable. And so, you know, you would hope that this would give them pause and they would think for a few minutes, but they don't. Um, verse 21, the people said to Joshua, nope, we'll serve the Lord. Okay, we'll see about that. And he says to the people, listen, your witness is against yourself that you've chosen for yourself to serve him. I, I love this. So they, they start this whole covenant of broken promises. And this would be kind of like in a movie or in a book where the narrator would say, now at this moment, the people are making this promise. Little did they know they weren't going to keep it. <laughs> or actually, they already knew that they weren't going to keep it. And so they, just, they start to make this covenant of broken promises. And we'll, we'll get to the covenant that he makes with them in just a minute. But, but they say, no, no, we're going to serve God. And he says, well, okay, you are witnesses against yourself that you've chosen for yourself to serve the Lord. Now, I want you to kind of imagine this scene and, and put yourself in there. I don't, I don't know if, if you would feel this tension, but for me, as I read through this, I can just feel the tension building as Joshua is leading them to, to, to this place. And, and their responses have been really weird. Like, He's not been encouraging them. He's not been like, hey, you're doing really good. You guys are hitting it out of the park. This is awesome. He's been like, hey, guys, y'all need to take stock of what's going on in your life, and you need to step it up. And they're going, no, we got it. We're all good. And so every time that he brings a challenge, they're like, nope, we got it. Nope, we got it. 
And so here's what he says. You need to understand that you are going to be called as a witness against yourself. That's what this means when, they, when it says we bear witness that we know what we're doing. It's like when you're going to go do something stupid and they make you sign a waiver that says, I know that I'm doing something stupid. Jump out of a plane or whatever, you know. I, I fully acknowledge that I'm doing something stupid and I'm doing something stupid of my own accord. And whatever happens to me is my responsibility. And, and you know, the funny thing is we're all well and good with that until what happens? Until the something stupid happens. And then what happens? Whose fault is it? Not our fault. Hey, man, I, you know, we, we had the conversation. We sat down. You signed the... Well, I didn't understand what you were talking about. I didn't understand you were saying that I was going to do something stupid, and I'm going to be responsible for the stupid things that I did. I thought you were responsible. That's what he's saying. You get that by what you're saying right now, that I can call you or God can call you as a witness against yourself. Could you imagine that? Like, we don't allow that in court. Like, you can't incriminate yourself. I mean, you can, but there's rules against it. But could you imagine being in a trial and you're being prosecuted and you're being cross-examined and they're like, hey, didn't you, like, here's tape of you saying it. Here's a witness. Here's yourself as a witness saying that you said this. What are you going to do? That's where we are. We bear witness that we know what we're doing. And again, you know, you can hear the narrator going, they did not know what they were doing. But that's what they say. We, we get it. We get it. We are witnesses. Yeah. Count the cost. Yeah. To understand that, you know, coming into relationship with Jesus is not just salvation. It's salvation plus discipleship and obedience. Yeah, you're right. It is the same. So, so they say, no, we got it. And, and he comes back again. Now, therefore, put away the foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to the Lord. And listen to what they say. Verse 24, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey his voice. This is, this is what gets me. We will serve the Lord our God and obey his voice. God is speaking through Joshua in this moment and Joshua has asked them multiple times to let go of their gods and they said, we'll serve the Lord. We'll follow the Lord. We'll believe the Lord. We choose the Lord. And he's like, no, no, no. Let go of the gods. We, we will listen. Almost what they're saying is we'll take that under advisement. And, and here's the thing. It's so easy to beat up on them. How often do we do that? How often is God clearly telling us, this is what I want you to do. And we're like, I, I hear it. I love you. I'm going to come to church. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to do that. I'm going to help in VBS. And he's like, no, no, no. Stop this. I got it. I'll be at Sunday school next week. I'll even come on Wednesday night and they're doing the book of Judges and that's awful. I'll even do that. <laughs> no, no, no. Get rid of this or love this person or forgive this person or whatever. And so it's easy to bust on them, but, but, but don't we really do the same thing? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So you're, you're, Larry, you're right. We, we do think that God grades on a sliding scale. And, and here's the thing that we think. We think God judges us by our intentions and not our actions. And we judge everybody by their actions and not their intentions. Sure. We do have a hard time grasping what grace is. Yeah. And here's the thing. You're seeing grace right here. This is God's grace through Joshua to these people being very simple, be very straightforward and very clear. This is what I want. And they're, they're being super obtuse. Like it's, it's like, I'm telling you and you're just like, I don't get it. I don't get it. That's for somebody else. It's not for me. So we will serve. We'll do this. We'll serve the Lord and we'll obey his voice. Hmm. 
you're not doing that right now. And I almost have to feel sorry for Joshua. I don't know how frustrated he was at this point, but here he is thinking, I'm about to die. I'm about to leave. And you guys don't get it, you know? I'm sure he's probably thinking about Moses because you remember what happened to Moses right before he died. He got frustrated. One of the many times he got frustrated with the people, instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. And because he disobeyed God, he didn't get to go in the promised land. And I'm sure that's kind of playing in Joshua's head. I better, I better watch how I respond here, you know? But no, 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 we will serve, Bonnie. Yeah, that's a great point. Bonnie talks about how that, you know, these are children of the people who died in the wilderness who actually saw God bring them out of Egypt. And that probably what the version of the Egyptian gods have been way watered down. Um, and, and also it's one of those things too, again, selective. We, we pick what we want. Great example of that was Sunday. Um, I was riding home with, with Cameron, my son, and, you know, and, and I always enjoy every Sunday talking to him about what, what happened in the sermon because he doesn't remember anything five seconds after we walk out. He's like, you talked about Jesus. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I did at some point talk about Jesus. And so I tried a different tack and I said, hey, so out of what you heard today, like how does that apply to your life? And he was like, it didn't really because I don't own slaves. <laughs> so if you remember the big, the big question I answered on Sunday is, is God, you know, does God condone slavery? And all he got was, oh, it, it wasn't for me because I don't own slaves. And I was like, come on. He was like, well, I don't want to own slaves. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. You kind of missed the point. And I, I did, I don't know how you guys felt. I did feel a little weird. We had a lot of people visiting on Sunday and I just wanted to say like, hey, we're so glad you're coming to church. Now we're going to talk about slavery. Glad you're here. <laughs> Welcome. First day, we're talking about slavery. How about that? Um, but, but, but that's what happens. Like they, they just kind of hear what they want to hear. They take what they want to take. And you're right. It probably has been watered down to the point that it's not about sacrificing this or not about doing that. It's just some small thing. And so it's easy for them to be like, well, I'm not like them at all. You know, I'm not doing what they did. And that's, that's a scary deal. So Joshua, again, gives them a call to remember. And look at verse 25. He says that Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Joshua said to all the people, behold, this stone shall be for a witness against us for he has heard all the words of the Lord, which he spoke to us, that it shall be for a witness against you so that you do not deny your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people each to his inheritance. So Joshua has a call to remember to them. And here's the funny thing. The call to remembrance, one thing was about writing a statute and an ordinance that got put in the law of God. Do you know what that is? Joshua 24. I mean, I, I love these little things, but Joshua basically says, I'm writing down this entire account and God has asked me to put it in his word so that it'll be a forever reminder that this happened of what you said and what you've agreed to and what you've said you're going to do. And again, they're not phased by that, but can you imagine as they, they began to realize that this is in God's word, this was divinely inspired by God? You ever had buyer's remorse? You ever signed on the dotted line and wish you could erase it as quickly as you signed? I'm thinking some of these people may have been like, uh-oh, well, we messed up. Because he's basically saying, listen, this is written down. And, and now here we are thousands of years later, and we're talking about what exactly happened in this moment where Joshua said, I'm going to put it down. And God's asked me to put it in the law of God to remind them and to remind us. So, and then he, then he puts the stone. This is always interesting to me because you hear this throughout the Old Testament. They'll put stones or they'll build altars or do these kind of things. And, and what happens, we've seen in a couple of different instances in the Old Testament, they'll say, so you won't forget. And we'll get just a few years down the road. And you'll have a, a, a situation where somebody comes along and they find these things and they'll turn to somebody else and say, why are these rocks stacked on top of each other? What are they here for? And there'll be some discussion about why they're there for and we need to figure that out. And then they come to realize that, oh, well, that's when God did this and that's when God said that. And that's, you know, and can you imagine the day when you come to this big fat rock under a tree 
And you're like, why is that there for? Like, that's weird. It doesn't seem like it was naturally placed there. Why is that there? And they have conversation. And then that's when they find, oh, well, that rock is there to remind us that we said that we were going to follow God and we were going to serve God and we were going to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, how's that working out for you? Yes, sir. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Yep. That's right. Yeah, God has to remind us because... Yeah. You know, uh, Martin Luther, and I, I love this quote, Martin Luther was asked one Sunday um, when he came to church, they said, Brother Martin, when are you going to stop preaching the gospel? He said, when you start believing and living it. <laughs> now, I mean, he was saying that to himself too, but that's the reality, Right. We, we do kind of get to the, like, can we move on? Can we move on? Well, yeah, we can move on when you start moving on with us, you know? Heather? Yeah. And that is an inner, and I was coming to that, so thanks for stealing that. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> when your wife one-ups you, like, what are you, you, know, you going to do? Um, no, yeah, when, when Jesus says that, that if you... You know, if you don't worship me, the rocks will cry out. They, they do believe that that is the place that, that they're standing on right now with Joshua. And so it's amazing. And, and even then, you know, what, what's happened is the, for, for the people in the crowd, it just went over their head. They didn't get it any more than the people got it during this time. So we've given you all the context. Now we want to turn one page over into Judges chapter one. And we're going to see now, um, we're going to see what happens when Joshua dies. You know, it's kind of like that, you know, cliffhanger edition. You know, we get this cliffhanger and Joshua dies and what's going to happen. And, you know, we'll have to wait for the same bat time, same bat channel. But here we are. Let's find out what happens. So verse one, now it came about after the death of Joshua that the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord saying, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I've given the land into his hand. Then Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites and I in turn will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Judah went up and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands and they defeated 10,000 men at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek and Bezek and fought against him and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Uh, but Adonai's of Bezek fled and they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. We'll get to that in a minute. Adonai of Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to gather up scraps under my table. And as I have done, so God has repaid to me. So they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. Afterward, the sons of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites living in the hill country in the Negev, which is the desert, um, and in the lowlands. So Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron formerly was Kirath Arba, and they struck Shishai and Ahimon and Talmai. Now here's the thing. I don't know how to pronounce any of these names and nobody else does. We're taking good shots, okay? So, so if you feel like you can pronounce it better, go right ahead. I will not be offended. Do what? Hey, that's, that's all it is. We're sounding confident in doing that. So they basically judges is the final push into the promised land. So what happens, uh, we'll find out in, in uh, Joshua chapter 24 or 23 that they had lived for some time in the promised land. They had experienced peace and safety and prosperity, but they had not taken all the promised land. And that's kind of what Judges starts. Joshua dies and he's like, hey, we need to finish the job that God had given us to do. It's your job to do now and go do that. And so they, they start this final push. Well, but what happens is they've entered the land, but they haven't fully possessed it. And so we still have all these nations that are there that God said to drive out and get rid of. They're all there. And what's going to happen is, is we're actually going to see that we're going to deal with the death of Joshua twice in Judges. We do it in Judges 1, and we come back in Judges 2, and they talk about the death of Joshua again. And the reason they do is it's kind of like Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 1 is kind of the overview of creation. We get the whole kind of picture in one shot. Genesis 2 gives us a more particular, specific ideas of what's happening during those times. Same thing with Judges 1 and Judges 2. Judges 1... <laughs> Basically, the theme of Judges 1 is this is what it looks like when the wheels come off completely. Have you ever wondered what it would look like just to see something disintegrate? Well, you're about to see what happens. 
And Judges 2 is going to be more specific. It's going to kind of deal what's going on with God's displeasure and his rebuke of the people specifically. Um, And then the rest of the Judges just kind of outworks that um, in the rest of the book. Now, the Canaanites were the next group of people that they had to deal with. And the Canaanites become um, part of a big story in the Old Testament. We, We see these guys and ladies and kids pop up all throughout the Old Testament. In fact, you know, God, these were one of the, the tribes that God specifically said, hey, you, you, you got to get rid of them. You got to get them out. Don't, don't marry them. Don't talk to them. Don't be friends to them. Get, just get, get them out. And we're going to see that that doesn't happen. Um, and one of the things that I want you to see, and this is important, when we talk about Judah and Simeon and all these kind of things, um, God is using one representative name for the entire tribe. Judah, the actual person Judah, is not still alive. Judah is one of Jacob's 12 sons. Uh, They all died somewhere either before, during, or after Joseph. I mean, and the famine in Egypt and all those kind of things. And so, in fact, they're carrying Joseph's body. What we find out in Joshua 24 is when they kind of come in and kind of get this pre-possession of the land, they bury Joseph's body. So this isn't literally Judah and Simeon and the different names. What it is, is that he's calling the whole tribe by one name. And so when he says, hey, who's going to fight for us? And Judah says, I will go. Well, it's the entire tribe of Judah. Okay. And when Simeon says, I'm going to go help him, it's the tribe of Simeon. So it's not one person. That kind of gets confusing sometimes. You're like, wait a second. All these people are the sons of of Jacob. How are they still alive? Well, they're not. It's their great, 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 great grandkids. I mean, we're talking 400 something generations um, since they were there. Uh, they spent 430 years in Egypt. So, but, but it's representative of the people. Now, seems to start out pretty well um, that, that they have a victory in Jerusalem. So they had not yet overtaken Jerusalem, but they had gotten close enough to it uh, that they were going to be able to take it. And it was the capital city of the Canaanites. And so what we see in these first verses is that Judah and Simeon kind of gather together and they just kind of steamroll over these smaller cities until they get to Jerusalem. And when they get to Jerusalem, they pull all out war on it. They overtake it. They capture the king. And then it sounds kind of ridiculous, but they set the city on fire. Now, I love this thing because we get these really weird details that we want to look at. So Adonijah Bezek is basically the Lord of Bezek, and that's the name of the town. Um, and that's kind of the title that this guy gave to himself, that he is the Lord or the God of this town. And what we find is this guy was pretty powerful and tough because he had conquered 70 kings. And he'd cut off their thumbs and their big toes. And, you know, they had, you know, go, you know what he said, they were, you know, fighting for scraps underneath my table. And then he says, as I have done, God has done to me. They capture the guy, he flees. I mean, they overtake the city, he flees, they capture him. Uh, they, they cut off his thumbs and, and big toes. And I, I'm thinking, like, you, you know, you read that and you kind of move on. I'm thinking, that's a horrible punishment. I mean, think about what you can't do without thumbs and big toes. Like you don't have balance anymore. I mean, your big toes give you balance. And now you don't have that on either one of your feet. And so I'm sure that makes walking very unsteady. And then taking your thumbs away, there's not a whole lot of stuff that you can grab onto and manipulate at that point, right? And, and so what happens, this guy has a very powerful king and they, you know, God brings them into this and, and, and overthrows this guy. And I want to be careful because we see these things and sometimes people think, oh man, this guy had a salvation experience. He got his thumbs and his big toes cut off and now he worships God. That's not what he said. He said, I've done this before, and now God's doing it to me. And, and he's kind of showing you what he believes. He's basically saying, well, I mean, I deserve this. And you could almost use the word karma. I don't believe in karma, but that's the word that we would say. What goes around comes around. You know, this is just how it goes. I've been on top. Now I'm not on top. That's what happens. There's no repentance. There's no remorse. There's no, hey, I mean, he, he even kind of, I don't know if it was jokingly or not, but he even says, I mean, hey, 70 people had this happen to him before. It wasn't like, you know what? I, I did this and destroyed 70 people's lives. And I'm, I'm sorry for that. We don't get that. But we do see God working through these people to bring a victory. Now, the problem is, Everything after that is very mixed results. They'll do well for a little bit. They do really bad. They recover, do really bad, 
do well, recover. I mean, all these kind of things. And so what we, what we see the rest of this stuff is, is just kind of how the wheels start to come off. Verse 11, from there, he went against the inhabitants of Debir. Now the name of Debir formerly was Kirath Sefer. And Caleb said, the one who attacks Kirath Sefer and captures it, I will give him my daughter Aksha for a wife. Othniel, the son of, of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. So he gave him his daughter Aksha for a wife. Then it came about when, it, when she came to him that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. Then she alighted from her donkey and Caleb said to her, what do you want? She said to him, give me a blessing since you have given me the land of the Negev. Give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. The descendants of the Kenite, Moses, father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms with the sons of Judah to the wilderness of Judah, which is in the south of the Ered, and they went and lived with the people. Then Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they struck the Canaanites living in Zephah and utterly destroyed it. So the name of the city was called Hormah. Judah took Gaza with its territory and Ashkelon with its territory and Ekron with its territory. Now the Lord was with Judah and they took possession of the hill country, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had iron chariots. They gave Hebron to Caleb as Moses had promised, and he drove out from there the three sons of Anak. But the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who live in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Likewise, the house of Joseph went up against Bethel and the Lord was with him. And the house of Joseph spied out Bethel. Now the name of that city was formerly Luz. The spies saw a man coming out of the city and they said to him, please show us the entrance to the city and we'll treat you kindly. So he showed them the entrance to the city and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and his family go free. The man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and named it Luz, which is the name to this day. Now, I'm going to stop there. We'll hit the rest of this in just a minute. But uh, there's a pretty prominent thing that, that happens here in verse 19. Um, it says that uh, the Lord was with them. The Lord was with Judah. And we, we kind of see that. There's some you know battles and victories and things. But we get to this part, right? It says the Lord was with Judah, but... They couldn't push them out of the hill country because they had iron chariots. Does that raise a problem for anybody? God can't conquer iron chariots? Is the problem with God here? No. So what happens is that as we look at this, you know, you could read this and think, well, God just didn't come through. I mean, iron chariots are too for much for him. Well, I mean, he conquered an entire army of Egypt that had iron chariots without an Israelite raising a spear or a sword. So there's got to be something else going on. And what's going on is you begin to see them not relying on the Lord. The first thing we see is they call out to the Lord, inquire of the Lord and say, what do you want us to do? How do you want us to do it? Judah steps up, God gives them victory. Well, then they kind of go past those victories and they go into this little place called Debir and they stop doing that. And, and they started relying on other methods than God. And so what were those other methods? Well, Caleb decides to give his daughter as a prize for the person who can go in and overthrow the city. We didn't ask God. We didn't pray for God's help. We didn't ask him to destroy the city. Caleb says, hey, somebody's going to get my daughter. And then Othniel says, okay, that sounds like a good prize to me. Let's do it. And so they went and they did. And then he gets his daughter and then the daughter comes along and asks for some more land and then asks for some water and all these kind of things. It's, it's funny how we just get these little tidbits of information. Like he takes this city and that's not good enough. I need the city and I need some land and I need some water, you know, and Caleb gives it to her. And then we move into the next one that we just finished reading where they get to Bethel and instead of praying and asking and seeking, they find a guy coming out of Bethel and said, if you show us how to get in, we won't kill you and your family. Now, you can look at that as a bribe, a threat, um, whatever you want, but I mean, that's the reality. And, and so you might think, well, how, how could they not find the entrance? Well, a lot of these cities were walled cities or they were built into the sides of mountains. And so they would hide entrances to the city and you had to be from the city to know how to get in. And probably what they were asking for wasn't the main entrance. They were asking for the entrance to get in in the back and to surprise everybody. Because where would you think the most fortified part of a city would be? Not a trick question. What do you think? Front door. Main gate. 
That's where you're going to have sentinels and you're going to have, you know, cannons and you're going to have, well, they didn't have cannons at that point, but catapults and whatever else, you know, things that they're going to have, they're going to have it all there. A show of force to make it like you're not coming through the front gate. And so what they're asking is you show us the sneaky way in that only you locals know about and we won't kill you. And that's what happened. He showed them how to get in and they spared him and his family. And so what we start to see is, is that they don't win victories. Well, we got this far, but we couldn't push them out of the hill country. But we got here and we couldn't get them out. We could have got here, we couldn't get these people out. Because they started making deals and they started relying on things other than God. And look at verse 27. But Manasseh did not take possession of Bethshean and its villages or Ta'ana and its villages or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages or the inhabitants of Ibliam and its villages or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. So the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. It came about when Israel became strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who were living in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Naholi. Or the, so the Canaanites lived among them and became subjected to forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or of Ahalab or Akzeb or Helba or Athik or Rehob. So the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beshemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, and the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anah became forced labor for them. Are you catching a pattern? Amorites forced the sons of Dan into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down into the valley. Yet the Amorites persisted in living in Mount Herez and the Aijalon and in Sha'abim, but when the power of the house of Joseph grew strong, they became forced labor. The border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akrabim, from Selah and upward. So not only were they making deals and not only were they not relying on God, when, when they got control, and, and that's what they're talking about here, when they came to power. So this isn't happening in the lifetime of the judges. This is happening later as David and Saul and Solomon and all of them became king. As they became king, they began to force these people, not David so much, but I mean, even during his time, they began to force these people into slavery. And it's so funny. I'm glad we talked about this on Sunday because now we can address this when they say, well, look, here it is. God's people forcing other people into slavery. I thought you said that didn't happen. No, I didn't say that it didn't happen. What I said is that God says that it shouldn't happen. And what we have happened here is people who could not do what God had asked them to do. And so they started finding their own ways to do it. And then when they found their own way to come into power, what was the first result that they did? Let's have slaves. I'm tired of these people. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Right. No, that's actually Caleb. Yeah, Caleb's not a tribe of Israel. Um, he's actually brought in and made part of the family of Israel, but he's not originally an Israelite. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what happens is what we see here is absolute power corrupts absolutely. You're, you're seeing them kind of just spiraling out of control. And here's what happens when you don't follow God and you start making deals and you start doing what you think is right and you start trying to figure things out on your own. When you finally get some semblance of control, you think, then you do something really horrible. And this is what they did. They had already contradicted the covenant they made with Joseph and now they've gone so far as to transgress the, God, the commands that God made in Deuteronomy and Leviticus that we talked about on Sunday. Pastor, yes, sir. Let this go. Yep. Yeah, you start making compromises in your life and there's no end to that. Yeah, you're right. That's right. Well, and that's exactly what Joshua was talking about. You know, for you need to get the idols out of your life. You need to get rid of those things that are keeping you from serving and following God in sincerity and in truth. And it's the same thing as Christians. The, the battle that we face now as Christians is not, you know, enemies on every side. You know, na nationally, the battle we find is enemies on the inside. Lust and greed and deception and lying and all those kind of things. Like, well, are we going to do battle with those? Um, and so it's, it's amazing to see that, you know, just in this one chapter, we, we just see kind of how the wheels come off. 
You know, we get in and, and the first thing we do is we cry out to God and we ask and we have some success and then, you know, kind of have some overwhelming success and maybe that kind of puffs our ego a little bit. And so we try to do it on our own and the next one goes okay and the next one goes okay. And then, you know, Caleb probably thinking this is a good idea. Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give my daughter, you know, all right, let's do that. And then we find this guy over here and hey, we won't kill you and murder your family if you let us in, you know. And, and then what happens is then we get to this place where you're losing and losing and losing and losing and you can't figure out why you're losing. And not only that, but when you finally kind of get your hand on it, you take that step that God's told you never to take. And, and that's where they are. So we'll end there. And uh, next week we'll, we'll pick back up. Uh, actually, no, next week uh, will be June 2nd. Next week what we'll be doing is I would really ask you guys to be here. Um, we'll be prepping for VBS. And so we need help. So we're going to do a work day uh, next Wednesday night from 5.30 to about 7.30. And so if you guys could do that, I won't be teaching to free you up to go help, okay? Um, so we could really use you. There's lots of things, paper that needs to be cut, stuff that needs to be hung up, um, all stuff that you're capable of doing. So please come back next week at 5.30 or at 6, whatever you want to do, and we will find a place for you to help, okay? All right. Any questions or comments before we go? All right, let me pray and we'll dismiss. Yeah, Larry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you're going to you're going to find that with every one of these groups, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah, when when God tells you to handle it, he wants you to do it now because there's consequences to that. One of the things we find out, and I can't remember the name of the people, but one of the people groups they don't drive out ends up being the people of Haman, you know, and he has that whole vendetta against the people of Israel because of that. So good, good, good comment. Thank you. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we had tonight. Thank you for your word. And I, I just pray that, that we would take something from it to sink deeply into our heart and to spring forth an action in our life. Father, help us to not only have sincerity, but truth. And, and not to fall on, on either side. That our truth is moved by our heart and our heart is moved by truth. And, and that these things would move us to go and share with those who are completely lost and apart from you. And so we thank you for this time tonight. We pray your blessings on each person that's here. In Jesus' name, amen.